this morning kind of stretch out a little bit. Uh, give, me a, give me a little bit to bring this message. Uh, I knew I had a little extra time this morning, so that's why I was using that time for that. Uh, I'm going to continue. Am I? I have one. All right. I'm going to continue a message that I started last week. My message last week was simply titled, If. Today I'm preaching on If, part two. Going back to some of the texts that we were in last week, Genesis chapter 4, going back to the part of the Bible where for the very first time in the Bible, the word if was used, and it was used by God. Genesis 4, verse 4. Abel, who was the second son of Adam and Eve, also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance falling? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, take this word which is your word, unlike any other word. And Father, let it be sown into our lives. Not just in our ears and bouncing off, but let us receive this into our spirits today. I know this has been prayed over and sought over and studied over, but the Holy Spirit now has to do the rest. And I pray that you would do a convicting work as you have done in me, in each one of us. I ask that in far more, God, because you're capable of far more than that. And we thank you today, and we give glory to you in the precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. If you do well, effectively, God is saying the same thing to us, Brother Raul. He's saying it to you and to me. He's saying, if you do well, it will go well for you. I've told you the story many times about back 25 years ago when my Life was a mess. I mean, it was a mess. I was so miserable. I couldn't tell you what was wrong. But Connie, something was bad wrong. I asked, uh, actually, uh, a dear client of mine named Trudy called me and said, How are you today, Doyle? I said, Terrible. How are you? I don't think I'd ever answered anybody like that. Usually, you know, what do you do? You just lie. I'm fine. How are you? And many times that's a lie. Many times you aren't doing very well, but you want them to think you are. God can't bless a lie. And God blessed me for being honest. And she said, oh, Doyle. She was a real strong Christian. She said, What's wrong? I've never heard you talk like that. I said, I don't know. My life's just shambles. She said, I have a counselor. He's totally packed. He's so busy you can't get in there for months. But if I can get you an appointment with him, would you go? I said, if you tell me, Trudy, to drive to Grand Rapids, climb up on the Grand River Bridge and jump in, I will do that if it will help me. And I meant that. I would have done that. I think I would have done it in the winter. That's how miserable I was. 
She called me back, Doral, it's a miracle. He has an opening. He just had someone cancel. Would you go? I said, yes. When is it? And I went and I met Paul. Paul. I know I've told this story. Would you bear with it another time, please? Because this is going to help somebody, I hope. Totally out of my notes. I told God, I said, God, please don't let me go down any bunny trails today. But I believe this is part of the message he wants me to give you. I went to Paul. and It was a miracle. Here was a guy that had so many credentials and letters behind his name volunteering his time at this Christian Counseling Center on Division in Grand Rapids called Life Center. I went in there. I started telling him all my troubles. Paul was a Holy Spirit filled believer. Had been the administrator of a large psychiatric hospital but he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he listened to me spiel on him all that's going on with me and how people had let me down and how miserable I was. He said, what's your beef, Doyle? I said, for one thing, my parents. What about your parents? I said, they lied to me. They would tell me they would do this or that, and they wouldn't do it. They hurt me. They disappointed me. They let me down. He said, huh, how did you respond? I said, oh, I remember how I responded. I pouted. I was a champion powder. I could pout for days. <laughs> I wouldn't speak to my parents for days at a time. Angry at them. He goes, oh. Oh. He goes, that wasn't very respectful, was it? I said, I, I, I'm in no mood to be trifled with. I said, what do you mean? I'm not the one that got that going. They did. I'm obstinate with him. He had this humongous Bible. It had to be at least this big. I think it was bigger. On his desk. And he turned the pages of that Bible over to, I believe it was Exodus. I could find it. And he looked at it. And he very slowly and ceremonially turned that Bible around. And he pushed it across the desk at me. He said, would you read that? Yeah, I'm a man of the word. You're talking up my alley. And it says, honor your father and mother so that it may go well with you. He said, you've already admitted, I mean, you didn't honor, respect your parents, did you? He said, I have a question. Is it going well for you? I could have knocked him out right there. And I angrily said to him, you know I'm not, or I wouldn't be in here. And every time I would propose an argument, he'd get in that Bible, turn it around, shove it over the desk, and said, would you read that? I'm going to tell you. I assume he was elderly then. That was 25. I'm sure he's gone on to his reward. But my God in heaven. How much do I owe that man? I wish I could say that that day I changed my life and repented, but I did not. 
nor the next week, nor the next week, nor the next week. Finally, and I kept getting more miserable. And finally one day, I remember I was in my office, and it was just building up in me this rage. And I walked out of my office, and I slammed my door behind me. And I walked by the receptionist. Where are you going to go? And I just went right by her. I went down, I got in my car, and I drove across town, and I went to this little chapel. And I went in there because I knew I'd be alone. And I went in there, and I threw myself on the altar. And I began to pray, and I began to cry, and I began to beg God, please forgive me for disrespecting my parents. So was it instant, Doyle? Yes. Instant. And the man that left that office, the man that used to go home every day and angrily stomp through the house, change my clothes, speak to no one, go and climb in bed at the end of the day, that man was dead. And a new man had come. Why? Because, I, I don't know why I'm telling this story all over again. Rita, you've heard it ten times. <laughs> because somebody needs to hear this. Thank you. Listen, you, the point of the story is you can't go against this and expect the blessed life. And oh, what a change it made in Doyle. When you begin to obey God. If you go against the principles of God, it will not go well for you. In anything, in our finances, in our giving, in our attitudes toward people. In, you can say, well... I don't know about that. In our unforgiveness of people. Mine happened to be my parents. And boy, that's a big, big deal. But even unforgiveness toward other people. Because they let you down. Because they disappointed you. Because they stole from you. Because they lied to you. Because they defrauded you. I'm telling you, when I had that, this funeral here several weeks ago, I thought I was going to be a referee. Because, man, there were some fights breaking out before that funeral. And I had to be Johnny on the spot and referee and saying, some were saying, do not let them in here. I don't want them in here. And I said, I've never told anyone in 22 years they couldn't come into our church. You're welcome. Come in. Get over it. Why? Here's the thing. If you fail, if you decide, I'm not forgiving them, then you have just sealed your doom. Because Jesus said, if you don't forgive those who have defrauded you, I will not forgive you mm -hmm. for your sins. Okay. That's all it took for me to recognize that, to realize that. Doyle said, enough said, Lord. Because I can't walk around with my sins unforgiven. Therefore, I forgive him. I forgive her. I forgive that boss. I forgive that neighbor. I forgive that relative. I forgive them all, Lord. If there's anybody that I haven't forgiven, bring it to mind so that I can forgive them. And right as we speak, I, there's not one person in this world that I have any unforgiveness for. To not give them forgiveness, whether they ask for it or not, doesn't matter, is for me to take poison in the hopes that they're going to die. 
I don't want the poison of unforgiveness in me. But the whole point here is, if you do well, it will go well for you. But if you don't, if you make a poor decision in that regard, it's not going to go well. In fact, sin is crouching at your door if that's the direction you want. What a marvelous father. He loved Cain. Don't tell me he didn't love Cain. He loved Cain. He came to Cain before he sinned. Before he murdered his brother. He tried to get in the way of it and say, Cain, settle down. Think about this. You need to get over yourself. You need to go back and start over. You need to try the sacrifice thing again. You need to look at your brother, Abel, and see the example he set and learn a lesson from him. Because I accepted his sacrifice. Therefore, I accepted him. But I didn't accept your sacrifice, and I didn't accept you because of that. Why? Because he came to me in faith. And you didn't. You came to me prideful and proud. And look at me. And look at what I'm bringing. Hey, how, aren't I a hot dog? said, you need to straighten up, Cain. Because sin's at the door. And oh, what that's going to usher into you, you don't want to know. So, there it is. Every single one of us, we're all Cain's of the world. God has come to us through his word and said, here's the word. Do this, and you can expect me to do that. Amen. One of the most famous, most often quoted, probably the most often quoted for revival scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn away from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will restore. I will heal. But you have got to do this first. And then I will come in. If you, Matthew 6, 33. If you seek the kingdom of God first. And his righteousness that goes with that. Then I will bless you. And all these other things that people seek after, I will just give to you. And he'll give it in abundance. You see how that works out? It's all about that little word, if, that is such a big deal. I'm so thankful for God's word. And so in Cain's case, I don't know how far I'm going to get into this, But I'll get into it a little bit further. In Cain's case, he said, if you, if, if you give in to the sin, it's, it's going to be a mess, man. Wake up! Did you know that the Hebrew word for sin is the same word that the Hebrews use for punishment. Isn't that intriguing? Because they don't seem the same, do they? We would think, well, what does that mean? Does that mean sin brings punishment? Yes! But it also means something greater. Sin is the punishment. You see how the world has got that all wrong? Let me give you a case in point. How somebody can be really, really messed up when it comes to salvation and sin. Stay with me this morning. God is, God's caught me on the right track here today. I sense it. Back in the 1940s, I recently read the, autobiography, the biography of Billy Graham by Greg Lowry. And it was, it was really good. Back in the 40s, when he was starting his national ministry, he went out to Los Angeles and they put up this humongous tent that held over 5,000 people. And they opened up and people came. Standing room only. For weeks. 
And, man, there were famous people coming, politicians, actors, actresses, rich, wealthy people, and even one of the wealthiest men in the whole world who, um, uh, if I can think of his name, his, uh, his name is still famous today, but he, he had newspapers all over the country. He's famous, wealthy. His house out in California, still yet, one of the most... Anybody know who I'm talking about? Who? Hearst. Hearst. Hurts. Hurst. Hurst, yes. Randolph Hurst. Thank you. He even he told his reporters, this is what he told them, and they knew what he meant. He said, Puff Graham. Puff Graham. Sent that out to all his reporters, which means build him up in the newspapers. Give him a lot of press. So people were coming in all over, man. This is a big deal in L.A. in the 40s. And thousands of people were coming to Christ. People who later, some of them became very famous for their Christianity. There was one man in L.A., his name was Mickey Cohen. C-O-H-E-N. He was a Jewish guy who ran the gangster syndicate out in California. They called him the King of California. He was powerful and cruel and mean. He came to the revival. And Billy Graham and others, including uh, the guy that regaled this, his name was Edward J. Orr. They say he's one of the greatest uh, researchers of revival that's ever lived. Edward J. Orr. I've read his books. He was there. And they all gave Mickey Cohen all the reasons why he should be saved. And uh, Mickey goes, hey, yeah, you know, yeah, well, okay. And they said, well, don't you want to accept Jesus Christ, Savior, and be saved from your sins? Yeah, I don't know, you know. And so he refused to hear it. Later on, a few weeks later, a friend of him was still trying to get through to him. He said, Mickey, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man should answer and open, I will come into him and have supper with him. He goes, is that what it says? He says, yes. He said, so come on, Jesus is standing at the door. Don't you want to open the door and let him in? He goes, okay. Jesus, come in. To my life. Oh man. They rejoiced. This famous. Infamous gangster. Murderous spirit. Had come to Jesus. Well three months later. His friends. Who expected to see a change in him. Said. Came to him and said. Mickey. We haven't seen anything change in your life. He goes, what do you mean? Change. Change? He said, I'm supposed to change? He said, I don't get this. He said, so-and-so is a Christian actor. And this guy over here is a Christian politician. And that fellow over there is a Christian athlete. He said, I'm a Christian gangster. He said, you didn't tell me I had to give up that stuff and give up my friends, which means his gangster cronies, in order to be a Christian. Deal's off. I'm out. Big mistake. Big mistake. Only God knows what would have happened to him. Like happened to the guy who became famous in the movie, Unbroken, who was also at that same revival, who gave his heart to Christ. And he did allow God to do a 180 degree change in his life. And his life became famous worldwide in books and movies and all kinds of blessings that came in his life. Mickey Cohen, 
That guy, the first guy, the guy I was just telling you about, he lived until he was almost 100 years old. And was very blessed. And was still running races into his 90s. Mickey Cohen died a horrible death with cancer and because of tax evasion and other things was thrown into Alcatraz prison. One of the most vicious and cruel prisons in our nation. See, here's the deal. And it's a very cool deal. So he's saying to us, here's your choice. If you choose well, it's going to go well for you. If you choose wrong, it's going to go bad for you. But... I'm not standing in the way of your choice. I believe in the freedom of men to make their own decisions. Do what you want to do with it. Now, I think that's a good deal. In fact, it'd be hard for me to love of God, to love a God that had built me to be a machine or a robot. And that's what some theologians teach, that he's sovereign and that God, everything that's happening, God put into place, God put all of this, he made the decisions long before the world's ever began. And, and, and it's just an unveiling, it's just the play being acted out that God wrote. No. God left the decisions of how we're going to live our lives up to us. And therefore, we are the recipients of it. Now, now in Cain's case, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to get off the first page of this, but whatever. In Cain's case, it led to a horrible punishment. He was cursed and he was banished. And look what happened to Cain now. In verse 10 of chapter 4 and he said to Cain, what have you done? What did you do? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Because when he had been asked, hey, where's Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? No remorse. You killed your only sibling. Is there remorse? Is he crying? Is he weeping? Is he repenting? Oh, no. But God knows. He always knows. What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out from the ground. Verse 11, so now, so now... Now that you've made your decision, you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a fugitive and a vagabond. You shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. No, I'm sorry because I got caught. That kind of repentance doesn't make waves with God. I'm sorry, I know I screwed up my life. My marriage is in shambles because I cheated on my wife. I'm so sorry. So many times the man or the woman aren't sorry at all. They're just sorry they've been caught. And now the gig is up. Now they pay the price. And that's what Cain is showing here. He said, my punishment's greater than I can bear. All about me. It's about me. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. Poor me! And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Well, right then it was only three people. Mom, Dad, Cain. Somebody said. Now I want to answer this once and for all. Because I hear this from all of these skeptics. They asked me, where 
did Cain get his wife? And that question throws them off, they think, off of everything else that follows in the Bible. Where did Cain? It's so simple. After this, it said that Adam and Eve went on to have more children, boys and girls. Cain married one of his sisters. And they had children. Now, that was his only choice. Are you with me? I don't know why people would get stuck on something so stupid and so simple. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. I've had people say they know what that mark was. I'm not convinced. I don't know what that mark was. But it was visible to anyone finding him down the road would know that they should not kill him by commandment of the Lord. Then Cain went... Now, this is so key. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. I want us to focus on that for just a moment. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. That is the penalty itself. To not be able to enjoy the presence of God. And when we're living in sin, when we're unrepentant, well, the presence of God is nowhere to be found. Have you ever found that? I remember periods of my life when I was in a, in a, a period of sin that I was not truly repenting of. I remember where it would be exposed in me as my anger. I, I'm sure that's not true of everybody. But I can tell you it was true of me. And I began to recognize whenever I've got a short temper, I know that spiritually I am not doing well. That was me. It was a good indicator of where I was with God when my anger was short. Because as a Christian, I, that's not who I am. I remember I was with a young man one time. We were in traffic and somebody did something. And, and, and I, I think I just screamed at this person that drove out in front of me. And I was just furious at him. And that young man who I was trying to mentor as a Christian minister, looked at me like, what? And I was so embarrassed. But it just came out like that because I was not in a place spiritually I should have been. And I had to repent. Boy, I, one thing that you, you, you cannot say about me, there's probably a lot of things you could say about me, good and bad maybe, but one thing you can't say about me, you could never say to anyone, that pastor, he is so contained, he is so insulated, his skin is so thick, you, you never really know who he is. You can't say that about me, because man, I have laid it out there, blood and guts and everything, many hundreds of times. I've showed you I'm not perfect. I've showed you the trials I've gone through. I've showed you I've wrought this out the hard way many times. So you don't have to do that. I've laid it out there, ugly, scars and all. Good or bad. I've had people tell me, you shouldn't do that, Doyle. I've had... Re people rebuke me in the church say you need to stop bearing your soul like you do that doesn't look good on you so what I'm willing to do it so that maybe you can do it the easy way and not the hard way like I had to does that make sense alright I'm going to end it John Bunyan 
Somebody said, who's that? He was a man that lived hundreds of years ago and wrote a book called uh, Pilgrim's Progress. He said, when we sin, it shows our contempt of God's grace and love. You think sin doesn't have repercussions? Believe me, it does. Our sins. And I'm so thankful that we live in a moment here, all of us, when we are alive, we have breath. Amen. I love that scripture. A living dog is better than a dead lion. We're living. We can breathe. We can still make a decision to say, God, forgive for the attitude that I've been carrying around. Listen, that was the sin of Cain. Yes, pride and all of that came into being. But it was his flippant, callous, careless attitude as he came before the altar of the Lord. Here you go. Look at me. Aren't I something? I grew that. That God said, I don't accept your offering. And I don't accept you. But now, we're on this side of the gospel. We're on this side of the crucifixion. On this side of Jesus Christ who died so that the sins of the world might be erased as we come to him. Aren't you glad you're living on this side of things? Amen. That you don't have to live in the curse anymore? Aren't you glad that the curse of the law has been taken from us? I am. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you today because you've helped me bring a message that I believe was from your heart. And I revealed some things about myself today and I retold a couple of stories, Lord, that I've told before many times. But God, I believe that you were in this and that you had this already in mind before this morning. And so now, Lord, I just, first of all, I want to thank you, God, for what you've done in my life. How you saved me and you forgave me. And I had to repent for the way I treated my parents. And I forgave them and you forgave me. Thank you. And it made a vast difference in my life. Father, there's been sins since then that I've had to deal with. And I've had to come to you and bow and repent. And express my sorrow. Many times with tears. And you forgave me. And you cleansed me once again. Thank you. And Lord, you'll do that not just for me. You'll do that for anybody. But we all have a decision to make. And you respect us and that decision and say, it's up to you. It's there for you. If you want it, you can have it. But if you don't, you'll bear the brunt of that. You'll bear the fruit of that. Thank you, God, that you gave us the decision to make. And so, Lord, I don't know what this means. Maybe nothing for somebody sitting here. Maybe it's going to go out on a YouTube and somebody's going to just key into that YouTube channel and say, Wow, man, that's for me. I don't know. But I pray, God, if there is someone right now or someone in the future that will hear this and say, I need to make that right with God right now. That they would just pray a prayer along these lines. Heavenly Father, thank you for dying on the cross for me and shedding your blood and bleeding out there on Calvary. Thank you that you did that in a perfect sacrifice, enabling me a sinner to come to you and express 
my sorrow. And that I am now repenting, which means I am now changing my life. Literally, the word means to change your life. And I'm not going back to that hog trough again. Forgive me, cleanse me, and give me the strength to walk faithfully before you and before others. I believe that you are the Lord and that you ever live to make intercession for my sins and that you've heard me and you've forgiven me and I'm clean right now in Jesus. My past sins are now forgiven. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, you say, well, I'm a believer, brother. I believe that. But if you prayed that prayer and got the sins off of your heart, and this confession, you've got to believe that Jesus heard it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? Amen. Isn't it good to be clean? Yeah. Amen. I was riding a bicycle yesterday. And in the course of that, God just brought two or three things to my mind that I felt I needed to just readdress with Him in repentance. So don't think I got it all together. I wish I did. I tell you, at this moment, as far as I know, there's nothing between me and God. But I was so grateful for that bike ride yesterday where God just reminded me of a couple things. I went, let's take care of that right now, Father. Isn't that, isn't that one? It truly is amazing grace. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Let's all stand. Maybe I'll finish this message eventually. It's morphing. It's morphing into something. We'll see where God takes it. I've only got, uh, well, let's see. Today's the 10th, 17th, 24th. I guess I have three more services to preach before James... The ploy comes in here. But what you got, Jay? I think the Lord's Prayer is the perfect time right now. The Lord's Prayer, yeah. We pray that every Wednesday afternoon to close yeah. down. And when we pray it, don't recite it. Pray it. That's what I do. And you can do that too. It seems appropriate. So we would pray. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses even as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Forever. Amen. Isn't that wonderful?